Okay, so now we're gonna go ahead and finish up uh, chapter 11. Okay, so we have already covered uh, most of section 11.2. We have a couple of remaining topics, the first being healthcare associated infections and to revisit Koch's postulates. Okay, so healthcare associated infections or HAIs also referred to as nosocomial infections. Um, these are infections that are acquired during a hospital stay. So these are things that are typically uh, transferred from healthcare uh, professional to the patient accidentally, uh, generally due to lack of um, proper hand sanitation. Um, about 4% of admitted patients can be exposed to these um, hospital acquired infection, infections. And so this is one of the reasons that we spend so much time talking about proper hand hygiene. Um, that amounts to about 750,000 cases a year and 75,000 deaths. So um, there are various things that are associated with healthcare associated infections, including the fact that most people who are in the hospital, of course, are compromised. They're there for surgery, they're there because they have some kind of an underlying uh, chronic illness or they have another type of infection. They're there for a reason and generally speaking, they're not well. Also, hospitals are a place where sick people go, and so all of the pathogens kind of collect there and uh, are eas more easily spread because they're kind of all in the same place. Um, lowered defenses can actually allow normal microbiota to enter the body. So we've talked about having Staphylococcus aureus all over our skin. And as long as it is sitting on intact skin, it's not causing any problem. But when Staph aureus gets into an anaerobic environment, for example, when you do abdominal surgery and you know the Staph aureus gets in there and then you're sewn back up, that becomes an anaerobic environment and Staph aureus becomes highly, highly virulent in an anaerobic environment. And um, infections can be acquired directly or indirectly uh, by the patients. Um, so for example, if somebody does not remove their gloves or properly wash their hand and then they touch something and then the patient touches that same thing, the infection can be uh, transferred that way. A non-living item that passes a, a, some sort of a pathogen is referred to as a fomite. Medical equipment, other patients, you know, if they happen to be, you know, in contact with each other or again, you know, they touch the same thing. Medical personnel who don't do proper hand hygiene, visitors, um, air and water. So and as an example, I've talked about Pseudomonas aeruginosa being all over everything and the reason you can't bring flowers into a burn ward. This is exactly what they're trying to avoid is the introduction of Pseudomonas aeruginosa into the burn unit. So healthcare um, uh, professionals really need to be extra careful with a lot of the things that they do. So uh, reusable instruments have to be really properly uh, disinfected or uh, sterilized. Um, Indwelling devices, things like catheters, like heart valves, like rep knee replacements, uh, tracheostomy tubes, all of those sorts of things at normal portals of entry especially um, are a real easy access point for these pathogens. And a large proportion of people in the hospital receive some sort of antimicrobial therapy. And so in addition to the people and the pathogens kind of being in the same place, you have a higher percentage of antibiotic resistant pathogens because they have been exposed to so many antibiotics and so much antimicrobial therapy. Okay, so most common hospital acquired illnesses include pneumonia, gastrointestinal issues, uh, particularly Clostridium difficile or C. diff infections, are, those are often hospital acquired, urinary tract infections, again because of catheters, 
bloodstream infections from all sorts of pathogens actually getting into the blood uh, past the normal point of entry, um, and surgical site infections. And that in particular is a uh, big area for staph infections. Five most common hospital pathogens, C. diff, as I mentioned, Staph aureus, as I had mentioned, Klebsiella species, uh, also from surgical uh, wounds, uh, urinary tract infections, often Klebsiella. E. coli is probably the most common urinary tract infection. About 90% of urinary tract infections are E. coli infections. And again, anytime you have somebody who has to be cleaned, you are exposed to their fecal matter and it's very easy then to pass an E. coli infection on with your gloves or um, hospital gowns that touch places that they shouldn't and so on. So you really do need to be very careful with that hygiene. And enterococcus, the same thing. Um, so uh, E. coli and enterococcus species coexist in the colon. Uh, any kind of fecal material can easily uh, pass enterococcus species. And this is just a pie chart of basically what we just talked about. So uh, very often you will have an infection control officer uh, in a hospital. And essentially what they're doing is they're looking at how those hospital acquired infections are being passed, what kind of HAIs are present in a particular hospital, and what kinds of policies and procedures can be put in place to stop those outbreaks outbreaks. They then turn those procedures into training for nurses and other caregivers who are regularly exposed to these pathogens and therefore are a vehicle to be able to transmit those. There are a set of universal precautions uh, that are sort of widely used across all healthcare situations and most hospitals have adopted all of those universal healthcare precautions. Okay, so we have already talked about Koch's postulates, so I'm just basically going to revisit them very, very briefly. Okay, the purpose of Koch's postulates are to identify the causative agent of an infection and or a disease. Um, they are a series of proofs that have become the standard for determining what agent causes a particular infectious disease, and it continues to be used to this day. It is reliable for the overwhelming majority of diseases, but there are certain pathogens, particularly ones that cannot be cultured. So as an example, uh, the syphilis bacterium cannot be cultured outside of the human body. And so Koch's postulates fall apart because you can't isolate it and then reinfect because you simply can't um, uh, culture that organism to be able to do that. Okay, so again, you've seen this chart before. This is uh, a, a graphic of Koch's postulates. So number one, you have to find the evidence of a microbe, so you have a candidate. Number two, you need to isolate it, you need to grow it. Number three, you need to inoculate another organism, so for example, a mouse. Um, and then number four, you need to re-isolate that same organism. And if you're able to do all four of those steps, you have that organism dead to rights in terms of how um, it uh, causes a disease. But again, there are a number of places where it falls apart. If you can't culture it, then you can't get past postulate number two. If the organism does not cause disease in a model organism like a mouse or a rat or whatever they happen to be using, uh, postulate number three falls apart. And so uh, there are certain diseases ju that just simply are not uh, amenable to being identified using Koch's postulates. But again, the majority of them, yes, you're able to do that. Um, so the other place where Koch's postulates tend to fall apart a little bit is when you have polymicrobial diseases. In other words, there's more than one organism necessary to form a disease. So by definition, you can't isolate a particular organism because you need two or more in order to be able to re- uh, to infect another organism and cause that same disease. Okay, so uh, concept check. For each of the descriptions below, determine if it pertains to an exotoxin or an endotoxin. Okay, so if it's toxic in minute amounts, typically an exotoxin. <laughs> 
causes systemic effects such as fever and inflammation. Well, actually both of those could do that, but mostly it's associated with endotoxins. Released by a cell via shedding or during lysis. Okay, so here you should be thinking of perhaps a gram-negative bacteria that has those endotoxins in its cell wall. So that would be an endotoxin. Composed of small proteins, typically that's an exotoxin. Most endotoxins are pretty substantial sized proteins. Composed of lipopolysaccharide, again, that's something you should be thinking a gram negative cell wall, so that would be an endotoxin. Can be converted into a toxoid. Okay, so that is something that you can uh, use to prevent. Uh, the toxic uh, uh, toxic reaction and so very typically that is also an endotoxin okay so 11.3 we're going to talk about the uh, subject of epidemiology and uh, differentiate it from traditional medical practice which is curing an individual disease uh, whereas epidemiology is more tracking and and surveillance of the population Explain what is meant by a disease being notifiable or reportable and provide examples of those disease. Define incidence and prevalence. These are terms that are often confused. Explain the difference between them. And discuss the three major types of ep epidemics and identify the epidemic curve associated with each. So epidemiology is the study of the frequency and distribution of a disease and other health-related factors in a particular population. And typically, there are a lot of different disciplines involved in epidemiology. So microbiology, obviously, for any kind of infectious disease, but an understanding of anatomy, where are these uh, infections taking place, uh, physiology, immunology, uh, general medicine, psychology, sociology, so how, you know, what kind of social factors are causing these diseases to be transmitted, ecology, and definitely statistics. So epidemiology is a heavily math-based uh, science, and uh, looking at the statistical curves uh, is really hard math. Um, so it also considers all forms of disease. For example, heart disease and cancer, drug addiction, mental illness, all of those sorts of things are included in epidemiology because these are diseases that need to be tracked. Okay, so uh, the origination of epidemiology actually goes all the way back to Florence Nightingale, um, who really laid all of the foundations of modern epidemiology. So she actually was there before germ theory so she just simply understood that filth whatever that meant contributed to disease and so she really instituted some pretty revolutionary practices in military field hospitals which is where she was a nurse so she separated linens and towels for each patient instead of taking a towel from one patient mopping up their blood and then going to the next patient and mopping up their blood and all that you know where you would get as we understand it now, you would get cross-contamination. She just simply said, you know what, if we keep the towels separate, we don't tend to cause as much disease. How about mopping the floor? <laughs> this is, that was pretty revolutionary in those days. Unclogging sewage pipes, okay? So this is what we look at now and see as really basic stuff. But in her day, those were really revolutionary concepts. And the other thing that she did was she kept meticulous notes. Um, and showed that more people died of, of infectious disease than traumatic injuries. So they, you know, they may have survived the, the blood loss, but then they got infected with gangrene and then, you know, you ended up losing more and more limbs and often dying from the, from the infectious disease that was caused by unsanitary hospital practices. So she was a real revolutionary. Okay, so epidemiologists um, identify causative agents using Koch's postulates or some adaptation of that for diseases that you can't use them directly. They track behaviors like exercise as a positive factor and smoking as a negative factor. They start to look for clues on causative agents, including pathology, sources, modes of transmission, 
they look for all of those different things. They track the numbers and the distribution of disease in a community. So how is that disease being passed from one member of a community to another? And the outcomes of these studies help public health departments develop prevention and treatment programs and also develop the basis for predictive models for how a disease is going to, you know, how the course of disease is going to uh, spread throughout a particular community at a particular time. Okay, so part of this is having to keep, as Florence Nightingale did, really meticulous notes. And part of the process is identifying what diseases are reportable or notifiable, okay? So there are certain diseases that must be reported to authorities. And part of it is because any disease that spreads rapidly, you have to report it so that they can get on top of it. Okay, there are other diseases that are reported on a voluntary basis. So uh, the CDC, for example, is going to keep track of those at a more low lying level uh, to, to gather statistics and be able to do their um, transmission models, but uh, they perhaps are not quite as catastrophic in the environment. So there's a network of individuals and agencies at all levels, local, district, state, national, and international levels. So the CDC is our national level that uh, does this kind of surveillance and is the main hub of all epidemiological data. But the World Health Organization is at the international level and they keep track of infectious disease that's being passed across countries and throughout the entire world. Okay, so here is a list of reportable diseases. I'm not going to go over them all. Take a look at them. You'll probably recognize a lot of them and understand exactly why those diseases are reportable. Okay, another continued list. Okay, so here are a couple of words that are routinely misunderstood. So there is a term called prevalence, and that is a total number of existing cases in a given population. So it's the snapshot at a particular time. So today, there are 100 cases of measles in Baltimore. That would be an example. And it is expressed as the total number of cases in the population divided by the number of people in that population. And so here's an example. The prevalence of smoking amongst adults in the US is 17% right now. Okay, versus the incidence, and that is the number of new cases in a particular time period. Okay, so that again is the number of new cases divided by the total number of susceptible people. And typically that is reported as a number of people per 100,000 in the population. So the incidence of new Lyme disease cases in the U.S. in the year 19, or 2014 was 8.6 per 100,000. So that would be how incidence, okay? So again, prevalence is kind of a total. Incidence is new cases. So typically these statistics are of concern to epidemiological or epidemiologists based on rates of disease and then also looking at it within certain segments of the population. So they may divide it male versus female, they may divide it by race, they may look at it geographically, you know, there are certain areas that are going to be more susceptible uh, to particular illnesses based on weather, based on how uh, closely together people live, all that sort of thing. There's another statistic that we uh, also track in epidemiology, which is the mortality rate. And, and that is the measure of the total number of deaths in a population due to a particular disease. Okay, so the overall death rate from infectious disease has dropped, although the number of persons afflicted with infectious disease, and that's referred to as the morbidity rate as opposed to mortality. So morbidity is sick, is being sick, mortality is being dead. So the number of people who die from infectious disease has gone down, even though the number of people who get infectious disease has remained pretty much constant at a pretty high level. Okay, and very typically, this is the kind of chart that you will see. So this particular chart on the top is tracking um, acute hepatitis C uh, by age group over time. 
and uh, below that you're looking at the incidence geographically so where do we see these high levels of hepatitis C in the country okay now we're going to talk a little bit about epidemics so there are a number of types of epidemics that epidemiologists look at. So there's a common source epidemic, which results from a, an exposure of multiple people to a single source of infection over a period of time. Okay, so if you guys remember, Legionnaire's disease was found in a particular hotel that the Legionnaires happened to be in, um, and it was traced back to the water, the water supply. So the water tank was infected with um, the uh, causative agent of Legionnaire's disease, and of course, everybody was drinking water from that common source, and so they were all exposed from a single point. Propagated epidemic results from an infectious, infectious agent that basically passes person to person, so it spreads throughout a population. Um, and in that sense, it ends up being sustained over time because even if you go to the original source of the infection and clean that up, it is propagating as you're trying to track it down. So propagated epidemics are tough to get your hands on, uh, to get your hands around. Um, point source epidemic is an infectious, infectious agent that comes from a single source and all of its victims were infected at once. So common source and point source are, are fairly similar uh, in that regard. So it's a single source and the difference is how long it takes for all of the victims to, be, uh, to become infected and ideally for you to find that source of infection and treat it. Okay, very typically, this is the kind of information that you'll see them tracking. Uh, so you're looking at uh, a disease, an epidemic over time, and that's how they kind of know when they're getting their hands on this epidemic, get, getting it, their hands around it, when those curves start to drop. Okay, so here are some additional terms that you need to know about for the subject of epidemiology. So an index case may or may not be the very first case, uh, but it's the first case that brought the epidemic to the attention of officials. So typically, when they see an epidemic forming, they're going to try and find that single point source, and that person is referred to as the index case. An endemic is an infectious disease that is sort of a normal part of life in a particular population, typically geographically. Um, so it has a relatively steady frequency over time in a particular geographic locale. Sporadic, on the other hand, are things that sort of pop up at different places and at different times. So it pops up, causes a bunch of people to get sick, and then everything settles back down again. An epidemic is when statistics indicate that the prevalence of an endemic or sporadic disease is increasing beyond what's expected. So you have this kind of baseline level of certain diseases, but then all of a sudden it pops up and a lot of people are getting sick from that particular disease. And that is the definition of an epidemic. A pandemic is an epidemic that spreads worldwide. And uh, again, that's where the World Health Organization steps in and starts to um, track and hopefully get to the bottom of whatever that epidemic is and stop it from spreading. Okay, so which of the following terms describes the total number of persons afflicted with a particular infectious disease in the entire population? And the answer is B, prevalence. 